Hello and welcome to the Final Girls podcast where we explore the intersections of horror film and feminism. In this first series, we're bringing on special guests to dive deep into film and TV shows with witchcraft at the heart of them. I'm Anna, co-founder of the Final Girls and your podcast host. In this episode, we are looking at one of the most underseen films by the iconic horror filmmaker George A. Romero. We'll be chatting about Season of the Witch, also known as Jack's Wives and also known as Hungry Wives. Romero's 1973 occult drama looks at an anxiety-ridden housewife who starts dabbling in the occult after meeting a real-life witch at a cocktail party. The film had a notoriously troubled production and release history, hence the multiple titles. The original distributor tried to market the film as a softcore porn picture. Spoiler alert, it isn't. Sadly, because of these issues, Romero's full version has been lost, but parts of it were discovered and re-released in home entertainment just a few years ago. It's a strange, eerie film, really clearly influenced by the feminist movement and also the witch craze of the late 60s and 70s. There's themes of suburban ennui, occult rituals, sex magic, and for the eagle-eyed viewer, a ton of elements and moments that we've seen in later films like The Craft. We'll be talking a little bit more about that later. I'm joined in this episode by broadcaster Marina Lewis, and we talk about some of the themes in the film, the way the witchcraft is presented, its lead characters, the relationship between mother and daughter, and how it stands up now. I hope you enjoy the episode, and if this is a Romero film that the completest in you has not seen yet, I definitely encourage you to check it out. You got to pick up every stitch, yeah. Phoenix out to make it rich Oh no Must be the season of the witch Must be the season of the witch yeah. Must be the season of the witch Rowena, thanks so much for your, taking the time for watching this weird ass film for me <laughs> A Season of the Witch Written and directed by George A. Romero. Probably one of his lesser known films. Yes. Had you seen it before this? No, I hadn't. And I'm really happy that I did because I can see where it does fit into his canon of work. You know, where he's trying to address uh, sort of societal upheavals and changes that are happening. And obviously with this, it's clearly the sort of women's lib movement mm. and feminism so I, I'm really happy that I saw it, but it's kind of crazy. So what a season of The Witch, a.k.a. Jack's Wife, a.k.a. Hungry Wives, because this <laughs> film has had like three different names. Uh, what is it about? So there is a housewife and she is having these unusual dreams that she is talking to her psychologist or psychiatrist about. And she starts obviously trying to unpack that. And then she ends up uh, finding that there is a witch in the town in Pennsylvania, I think it's set. So she goes with a friend, talks with this, and then it starts to unfold where she wants to become embroiled in it. And you think, actually, is she really a witch or is it more just an allegory and an excuse for the behavior that she's now deciding to do, whether it's for her sort of new burgeoning sexuality in her sort of middle-aged life um, as a housewife, or is it an excuse because she is rebelling against her husband and she ends up sleeping with someone else and she's trying, she feels guilty. So is it just manifesting in that way or has she really created a love spell and that's what you're left questioning and do you think it succeeds as a horror film or as a witch film I feel it does because ultimately with witches and witchcraft it's all about reclamation of power and tearing down patriarchal power structures and you see this with what happens with her husband who's abusive and coercive she's clearly someone stuck in the monotony of a marriage she's not happy in, in a life where she doesn't really have any purpose. She was defined by marriage and her child, who's now grown up, has her own sex life, decides to leave and move out of the house. And she suddenly realizes, 
I don't have anything going on in my life and I'm not happy. And she has a, a slightly older friend as well who's clearly going through um, a crisis in her own marriage. She's not happy either. She feels that she's starting to become this hag and that's part of the visions that Joan has as well. She keeps looking in the mirror in these dreams and seeing herself almost as a crone, yeah. which is quite an interesting choice that she looks like one of these old stereotypical witches and then yet she still wants to harness this power and energy she feels that she can get from being a witch i mean the first what 10 minutes of the film are kind of a crazy dream nightmare sequence where she's sort of running through the woods and she's been uh, chained up and put in a dog collar and tethered to her husband yeah literally tethered to her husband and then that then expands and uh, sort of bleeds into her waking life as well mm-hmm. where as you say she sees herself as a crone and it taps into so many of general female anxieties but this particular character Joan's anxieties of getting old and her life being wasted yeah or potentially becoming kind of less desirable mm. and I found her daughter and their relationship really interesting because it almost seems competitive to a degree i was gonna say that i thought there was an element of jealousy which i can imagine must have been the case at the time when you've got this generation of women who just went from sort of school to basically just being mothers and wives to then seeing their children getting to be free and have um relationships because you often you see her talking to um the professor of her daughter who she's also in a relationship with and he's she's like oh is this how things are now I can't that's hard for someone like me to come to terms with and I can imagine it must have been very difficult knowing that all this excitement escaped you so I feel that there was a competitive element there which is why maybe she decided to try and go after um is it jeff or jerry greg it's a g (laughs) (laughs) and what did you think of the the first witch we meet in the film which is this sort of tarot reading woman who we meet at one of these suburban cocktail cocktail parties that's very reminiscent of like madman um and she seems to be the most interesting person at the party. All the women are flocking around her. They're all like, oh my God, you're a witch. Tell us more. What does that mean? Do you run around naked in the jun- in the forest? Do you kill goats? What do you do? Tell us. Like it's such a, a kind of um, a cocktail party attraction, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Very 60s, 70s vibe. But I feel that it's these women they're actually craving to talk to a woman that maybe understands them from a different perspective that they're not just these uh women that like to gossip and talk about each other behind each other's backs they're actually quite deep and they've got other levels and anxieties and concerns that they'd like to talk about and this woman is obviously able to draw it out of them and she's almost exotic in that way and I think they're drawn to that it's almost hypnotizing to them which I think is fascinating and I just love her hair she's very stereotypically sort of flamboyant and I feel that we also then see the women other women in the film including Joan starting to wear more vibrant makeup after meeting her because they're obviously heavily influenced by Mm -hmm. her and her behavior um, which is nice because it feels like these women are trying to have some kind of sisterhood and it starts feeling like actually maybe that's the element of um witches that they're fond of is it feels like a coven and it feels like there are other people that they could be connected with that's interesting because i don't really get a sense of sisterhood at all oh really yeah i got a sense that i mean joe is presented as such an isolated character Mm. like you can sense and you can feel because we're inside her head from the very first moment of the film you can get a real sense of her loneliness, of how detached she feels See. from her husband, her mm. daughter even, her friends. Mm. She seems genuinely interested in what Marion, who's the the party witch. That's what um, I feel. She's desperate for a bond she's with She's definitely someone. desperate for a bond, but I, I feel like her the rest of her friends are just there for laughs. Yeah. So this kind of genuine interest that she starts to get in Marion and kind of asking her questions that she's maybe 
has never asked before mm. or even forcing herself to ask questions about what she wants and what she's willing to do for what she wants as well mm. and one of the interesting bits i found about marion the witch just to go back to her is that she was talking about money mm. do you remember the at the first seance when she does a tarot reading for them and she has this unusual way of gaining payment where she tells them to put money in an envelope and send it to her house but not include any form of identification they should send what they feel is appropriate mm. but they shouldn't own it so she'll never know where the money comes from that's a really interesting prospect isn't it it's like yeah. why is she choosing to do that maybe she feels what she says because like yeah she's uh, weirdly enough she says oh it's not because I'm being altruistic or uh, trying to be extra witchy it's because people then send me more money no I missed that how did I miss that I in the film <laughs> she literally, there's a whole uh, bit of dialogue where she's like I'm I'm I do it this way because people then give me what they really want to give me without having to have that awkward interaction around money and that awkwardness around women and money, I found really interesting. Yeah. Especially considering this is a film from like 1973. Yeah. Well, uh, Romero himself says that he feels it's a feminist film. So maybe that's why it's trying to just give a bit more power back to the women and let them have this conversation, especially if they're housewives who probably have all their money controlled by men. Um, but I saw it. I don't know. Maybe I just misread that aspect of the film. But I thought she was asking them to give something that just meant something to them over to her rather than payment so I thought she was giving them the option that they could just pay in another way which is quite fascinating so I don't know whether we've just seen it in different ways which is quite interesting or I'm not sure really yeah we're gonna watch it later yeah this is where we're like yeah put it back on again <laughs> so what do you think about the way that we then follow Joan on her witch discovery process I found it really cute. It's kind of adorable the way that she's walking through Pennsylvania with her sunglasses on and Donovan's Season of the Witch plays. Yep. It's so knowing, so meta. And she's obviously proud of the fact and kind of thrilled and titillated by the fact. Secret yeah, now. she's like, oh, I'm a witch. You know, when the person who's selling her the stuff from the store, it's like, oh, this is what witches use. And she's like, well, I'm just, I'm just interested. And you can see she gets a little bit of a buzz that this mm -hmm. guy might recognize that she's a witch. And I found it kind of adorable. But then she does have a bit of a panic and a freak out with Greg. But also, can we just talk about the fact that the scene in the bookstore is literally the scene from The Craft. I know. It's literally almost <laughs> word by word. I mean, I, I I wrote it under my notes in all caps. It's the scene from The Craft. <laughs> so do you remember in The Craft where uh, Sarah goes to buy some witchy books? Or maybe it's Nancy when she buys kind of a dark magic book. Yes. And the, the bookseller, who's a practicing witch as well, sort of warns her against it. The same exact scene happens in Season of the Witch. And I, love I loved it because I hadn't seen this film before. I was like, oh, you my can see where it's God. obviously yes. it's, people have watched it and taken influence from it, which is kind of amazing, yeah. really. That's and it's also that kind of passing of the knowledge yeah. as well of the bookseller, who's a who's a man, is sort of warning her mm -hmm. as well about it and kind of dismissing her, but then seeing that her interest is genuine as well. Mm. So it kind of warns her about the powers that these books control and the book uh, there's always a, a grimoire or a book of forbidden knowledge in in witch films how do you think her gaining of this knowledge and this power fits into other approaches to witches that we've seen on screen i feel that it's definitely a similar process where she's coming to terms with the th fact that she might have this control over herself now that may inspire fear in others because often that's what witches are like they're just misunderstood people and that's why people are afraid of them 
Um, it's because they are scared of their power. And I feel that she is grasping with that and she has some elements of guilt, which is why I feel that she starts seeing the devil coming in and attacking her in her nightmares. It's sort of moved on from her other anxieties to a new um, fear uh, that she's actually inviting the devil into herself when really I think it's her just realizing that she does have this ability in her life to change her narrative and that's where her true power lies is through that whether it is really that she's harnessing these magical powers because you never really see anything mystical happening she casts clearly casts this love um, spell on Greg who's the professor that was sleeping with her daughter but he had originally before she even did her first bit of magic he would said he's there and he's ready to do yeah. something if she wanted and he'd already had a sequence earlier in the film with her friend talking about suggestion where her friend thinks she's on um, smoking weed but she clearly isn't and she starts having a panic attack and talking about um, what she's really scared of and so I feel that really is it actually a journey of a witch or is it someone who is just taking the sort of stereotypical ideas of what it is to be a powerful woman who's often portrayed as a witch. You're either a bitch or a witch. You know, it's you're someone who's a badass or actually you've got all these magical powers. And I feel that she's using that as her reasoning for it. She's like, I want to do this stuff. I want to have these sexual desires and experiences. I want to break away from my abusive husband. But the reason I want to do it is because I have this power in me that's from magics. And it's quite interesting. It's like a way of her in that reading of excusing some of her desires mm. and instincts because or allowing them to flourish because it's the power of magic. And mm. because she's a witch now and by being a witch, she's no longer in control of that or more in control, mm. maybe kind of not beholden to the rules that she's been beholden to for her entire life kind of has as a woman who needs to be married, needs to be uh, faithful to her husband, doesn't need to prioritize sex, doesn't need to prioritize her own uh, passions or desires or ambitions and kind of rebelling against that mm. by using witchcraft as an excuse or a channel. Yeah. yeah. And do you think then that is she really a witch or is it all a metaphor? What do you think is more interesting? I actually think it's, intriguing that it might just be a metaphor I think it's Romero trying to do something a little new maybe he doesn't pull it off as brilliantly as some of his other works but I think he's trying to use horror tropes to challenge something and show what women have to go through and the guilt and that fear that they have when they have to break free from the uh, social norms that are just crushing them down and beating them down on a day-to-day -day basis and so I think if it's a metaphor then it's a very clever one you know it's been I think quite subtly done because there are still little elements where you feel that she could be a witch and maybe something has happened but I feel that it just shows a woman who was on the edge and that she's actually just been offered an out and she takes it which there is nothing wrong with that. But if you're into seeing people casting spells and potions and doing bits of sort of chanting from a book, you're going to get that in spades in this book, in this film as well. So, mm. you know, if you're into the iconography of the witch, you definitely have that on a platter with this film. So what do you think about how the act of magic is actually portrayed? So the, the spell casting, the chanting, the look of the witch when she gets into it what did you make of that I feel it was all more about ritual almost in a religious way where it's channeling energy it felt very much just someone who's sat down almost in a meditative way just trying to be at one with their surroundings and 
like you said earlier, have a bit more control over things. So it felt very personal. It didn't necessarily feel like she was offering herself up to a higher being. It felt like she was doing a selfish act. And I don't mean that in a horrible way. It's like she finally feels she can do something for her. And that's what the witchcraft and the magic provided. She could do something that was therapeutic and repetitive and almost sort of creative and artistic. You could see this as someone who has felt very within herself and this gave her an opportunity to do something new and bold and exciting with like books that she's going through and finding symbols and she's drawing them on things and the they very much hold the camera on some of the chalices that she's looking at and playing with and she's clearly just finding herself through these objects and that's why I felt it was kind of almost religious because it's like when people are holding prayer beads and they're using those and through their hands to feel like they are finding themselves or talking to something beyond themselves. I find it very interesting because it really like it says it really emphasizes the ritual Mm. and it really reminded me of these 19 late 1960s and early 70s British films about the the witch craze that was mm. happening in Britain at the time and particularly because of um Alexander and Maxine Sanders while well, they were dubbed the king and queen of witches over here and they also were really had a lot of media attention and there was a couple of films made about them and we actually screened them last year as part of this uh this here be witches season and it was fascinating especially with secret rights which is now available in blu-ray and it's on bfi player as well and it is a hilarious 40 minute film which starts off with and i'm sorry i'm going off on a tangent here but it so fits into this aesthetic it starts off with this like mock ritualistic almost like ritual rape of this young woman and then alexander sanders turns to the camera and says this is not what we do (laughs) and then it becomes actually a an attempt and it it is fictionalized to a degree like it's a pseudo documentary Mm -hmm. really you should take it with a grain of sand but the intention behind it was to sort of dispel some of the the satanic panic myths around what witches practicing witches Mm -hmm. were doing at the time but also how it looked and how those rituals were performed and the fact that it's so quiet and sensitive spiritual almost and it's not melodramatic and over the top that you often see in other films it did feel very um subtle and gentle really yeah and something very much that joan in season of the witch does very much in secret as well like it feels like her secretive uh almost a hobby yeah but also she she sort of takes pleasure in learning and growing and taking those little steps so kind of moving on up from doing one small thing to doing a couple more to involving more ingredients it's almost like cooking right yeah. like this weird chemistry that she's starting to master and then it becomes a bit more theatrical she puts on a uh, flowing red robe which is also a whole nother trope in witch films from like the devil's own uh to this to the 2018 Suspiria um there's a few of those things of theatricality that I really I really enjoyed and it feels so 70s as mm. well yeah did absolutely. you feel kind of the um, do you feel like it's a it's a product very much of its time I really think it is. Um, I think it's trying to find elements of excitement in the mundane, which I think they tried to do in the 70s because they didn't have much else on hand, whether it was with uh, sort of special effects and CGI, they didn't have any of these things. They tried to elevate these abstract ideas through regular day-to-day life, whether it's someone in their house or their home or a shopping mall or something like that that's what they tend to do in the 70s they try to make it so you could invest in what these people are doing but also have those notions and ideas turned on its head with the fact that yes she's a housewife who's just doing her day-to-day stuff but she's also a witch and it's great and you see again 
when you look at films like The Love Witch, which is clearly a pastiche of these kinds of 70s films with how it looks visually and the acting as well is quite a similar way. You can see that she's just trying to get about her day-to-day basis as well, Elaine is, and but then she's obviously got this sort of secret thing and ritual at home that she wants to do to create her happiness and her love and desire. And I feel it is definitely of its time, stylistically. It looks very 70s, very early 70s, a little 60s with the makeup as well. But I think it works really well. I think it's actually, it feels like it could be something from our time that's almost play acting that it's 70s. It feels like it hasn't aged too much, even though it's of its time, because I think it doesn't go too over the top with the it themes. It feels so artificial. Yeah. Like you said, it feels like it hasn't aged, but then also it a- it's aged yeah. massively. Absolutely. Like it feels like a time capsule, doesn't it? But I feel because it's just relating to themes of women trying to regain their power. That's timeless. It's timeless, because we're still fighting now to this day with the Me Too mo- movement and you know all the other things that are going on around us at the moment and so actually it feels very fresh in the fact that it's just tackling a woman that's trying to beat the patriarchy and let's talk a little bit about how it fits into the rest of Romero's filmography because you mentioned it before as well but he did want to make an overtly feminist film Mm. he was really inspired by the the women's liberation movement um but it's interesting that actually some of his producers tried to recut it or remarket it as a softcore porn film it's so crazy that which would have been extremely disappointing because there's not a lot of sex well, that's in this. the thing it apparently didn't um distribute well and i'm not surprised because there aren't really any out and out sex scenes i think you have a couple of flourishes of boob. Yeah, you've got a little bit that's of boob, it. and that's it. Bit and you've side got boob, maybe. one very skinny, not very <laughs> attractive <laughs> middle-aged man laying on a carpet. Have you noticed how in seventies films everyone has sex on a shag pile rug? Yes. Yeah. So, the, but you, also then Greg falls there. asleep on the carpet, which I found very suspect. It's like, are you really that tired from making love that you've just fallen asleep in the spot you're in, butt naked? I don't think that's necessary. Very doesn't realistic. notice. Doesn't notice Joan completely setting up the whole living room as a witcher ritual, trying to get like tears from his eyes, like sticking a finger in his eye as well. Whilst yeah, he's, trying he's to sleep. gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's just classic, isn't it? Sometimes you see when directors are trying to maybe twist it a little bit to fit yeah. the narrative, and I'm, I'm really sad by the fact that this is not romero's final cut Mm. like there's a beautiful um edition that was reissued quite recently by arrow video but this is not the one that was adapted from his original script Mm. because it got recut and you know certain things were lost and now this is the the version that's been salvaged but it's sort of a mishmash of all the different versions and not his script i would absolutely love to see what the original was because i think he's managed to achieve a lot from this already as we've already unpacked but to see maybe what his main intention was with making it a real feminist piece and this is where sometimes distributors and producers can have a damaging control on an artist's work if they're trying to take this control from it and remove certain elements that they fear means it's not going to sell or Mm. it's not going to be as successful I I mean it just it blows my mind that they tried to make it as like I mean softcore porn because it's just so beyond that it's like is it because it's simply a woman trying to find herself and have sexual pleasure quite possibly because I think there is a scene in there that obviously where she is um, masturbating to the sound of her daughter and Greg having sex and I feel that there is an issue especially in America they have a real problems when it comes to certification with showing women enjoying sex you can have very brutal um, gunshot wounds or people dying on scene really close up but then suddenly it's like rated R if you see a woman orgasming And it's crazy. Maybe that's why they were doing it. If it was a man or if it was the other way around, maybe they wouldn't have seen it like that. But I feel that because it's trying to tell a woman's story, especially at a time where 
men may not be happy with women having these newfound freedoms with feminism and women's liberation they felt that they couldn't put this out and people are going to be really deeply unhappy with it so maybe that's kind of why they massacred it a little bit to make it suit their narrative yeah unless a male audience could jerk off to it then it didn't have value yeah absolutely Which is just such a shame. I mean, it's a shame that none of that has been preserved. I read that it was cut down from 130 minutes to 89, which is what it's now. It's so short. So all of that is lost. Mm. And I wonder how much maybe more horror or more witch exploration or more or a more defined reading of whether Mm. the occult elements of this film are actually real or whether they're all an excuse for Joan to explore herself and explore her sexuality a bit more. So I do wonder whether actually it was meant to be more that she was a witch, but they felt they had to dilute it down and make it actually that it's not a good thing if people become witches and they just turn to the occult when they want to have an excuse for bad behavior. Could that be the aim of their cutting of this film Mm. I don't know because I would love to see it from a more supernatural perspective seeing her um, cast spells and then actually have them work and be more sinister I'd quite like to see slightly more graphic scenes of witchcraft in it maybe there were in the original cut but would we like? Is there any way of unearthing that stuff? I have I think, no idea. I think as far as I've read, I think they're lost, which is a real shame. Like the original negatives, mm. and if someone knows any different, I'd freaking love to know. But I found Greg really interesting. Yeah, he. Oh, you don't like Greg? No, I. It's <laughs> difficult because I felt that he was very knowledgeable in the fact that he was able to manipulate women firstly it felt like he was abusing his power of being a professor by clearly sleeping with his student unapologetically in front of like her family and obviously they're flaunting the fact that he's got his arm around her there i mean it was like the 70s to the extreme in this film the way that he um, manipulated joan's friend as well by pretending that she's um, smoking weed and she was clearly panicking. He was pushing and pushing and pushing. And then on the stairs when he said he came back to apologize, but he was clearly needling Joan for a reaction saying that she wants him. He was very uh, full of himself, but maybe they were trying to actually show him as a sort of cocky younger generation male um, of that time where he's trying to, again also be liberated sexually as well but he's trying to show the power he can exert over women it's just is he meant to be a bad guy and representing the patriarchy or is he meant to be just this free loving guy that is just happy to be with anyone because he loves women but I actually got quite negative vibes from him I kind of I don't think he's one or the other really Mm. I think he's obviously benefiting from his privilege but I found his relationship with Joan quite straightforward. Like he's sort of the spark that awakens her in many ways. The fact that he needles her, the fact that he very overtly, very clearly states his interest Mm. makes her in a way that and something that her daughter says in one of the earlier scenes make her sort of see herself as a sexual being again Mm. and reawakens those desires. And he very clearly establishes boundaries with her as well, which I found quite interesting. You know, they're clearly having a sexual relationship, but at no point Joan falls in love. Uh, and he or doesn't obsesses. try to lead her on in any no, way. No, he doesn't at all. So I found that quite an interesting approach to, you know, mature, quite open, you know, amoral to a degree because Joan is cheating on her mm. husband. Uh, approach With to a sexuality man as well. Yeah, but he also challenges her when, towards the end of the film, when she's doing the spell, and she's convinced that he only wants her because of her spell. He says has this amazing line where he accuses her of covering up her own desires for him, for sex, for an illicit affair, for fun. 
again in her life uh, by covering that up with witchcraft. And he just says you should just take responsibility for what you want and take responsibility for wanting it, getting it and enjoying it as mm. well. And I found that sort of hedonistic approach to be quite fascinating. And it was that sense of he was, you know, encouraging her to give herself permission to enjoy things, mm. to be less focused on the rules that have made her unhappy and boxed in and given her all of these anxieties and enjoy whatever it is that she wants to enjoy. It might be him in that moment. It might be someone else. Mm. But to essentially not overthink it and just go with it. And there's that weird scene where he just, they start... Uh, sort of play fighting and then having sex and he's just constantly screaming at her. And, and yeah, yeah and he's just screaming at her oh it's just he uses another word I can't remember what it is <laughs> he's just screaming at her it's just screwing it's just screwing <laughs> Joan <laughs> but it's another word but I watched it really late and I can't remember it it's something like it's not boning it's something else <laughs> oh it's a uh... Like bowling. Yeah, it's yes, bowling. It's bowling. <laughs> it's bowling, John. It's just bowling. <laughs> Which obviously I think has a slightly different meaning now. Because I think if you're a bowler, it's because you're out like hustling. Yeah, or so like you have a, a lot like, of money. Yeah, so I was a little bit like, that's an interesting way of That's definitely it. aged, for sure. <laughs> that one element. I was like, what are you doing? During I'm your... hilarious. Some interesting foreplay going on there, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> for sure <laughs> but yeah I think he's clearly shown to be educated and liberal and free thinking to a degree to a degree honest as well but also has slightly toxic masculinity traits in him I feel a little bit with just how he can be a little controlling or dismissive or a bit sort of cocky and the fact that when he just like grabs her and they do start having sex but it seemed quite violent and controlling when he sort of grabs her down to the floor which felt a little uncomfortable for me which is why I'm on the fence I don't really feel that we're meant to like him but I don't feel we're meant to hate him either which again it's human we're flawed we we're not perfect we're what we you know we've got bad elements about us and we've got good elements and I feel that that was him but I definitely feel he's not meant to be just this sort of misogynistic asshole that we have all our anger on because I feel that was more of the husband who clearly neglected her went away all the time um he abused her because he hit her as well and was saying you should have done this and was very controlling with certain elements to do with the daughter so I feel he was probably the bad person which makes me think that maybe we were meant to feel that he was more of a positive element in her life in comparison because he did feel the polar opposite to her very sort of short back and sides, cumbersome husband. And he's this sort of slightly scrawny, shaggy haired, beatnik. College professor, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he's an intellectual, like a sexy intellectual in the 70s. I don't think Nerd he'd love. stand up now. Yeah. Um, so what did you think about the ending? When she gets initiated. For me, it felt like it almost tied in back to the beginning. That ultimately she's just tethered to something else now. Is she completely free? Probably not. She's just now in a new order of things. And she's going to be controlled in a slightly different way. At first it felt like she was free. And she was shed of everything. She was not wearing her sort of typically... Um, middle class housewife clothes and suits. Well, like, she's, she's she was naked. completely naked. Yeah, she's so naked she's when lost she's it all. She but shed she... it all. But then she then has this rope put around her neck and she's tied up to something which links back to her dream in the beginning where her husband guides her into a cage with a leash around her neck. And I just start worrying that it's she may have some element of freedom now that she's not tied to her husband anymore. But is she free? And I don't think she is. It's like, is she now just transferred from one sort of element of where her life was controlled by other people to another? And maybe that little bit in the film was where she had her freedom. I loved as well that once again, unexpected craft origin scene in that 
uh, initiation into the coven scene, they literally ask her, how do you enter this coven with perfect love and perfect trust? Line by line. It's just amazing. I was freaking out. Just like, oh my God, I know this, I know this. I was absolutely freaking out. It was it was very well shot. I think it was lovely. It was not too um, gratuitous and it wasn't very graphic with her. It was clearly that she was willing to do it. She wasn't being forced into anything. She was letting herself go and she felt that she had this new, um, new life beginning. There's a beautiful line where she says towards the end I know myself for what I am Mm. and it's this real sense of her coming into herself and coming into her own and being confident with who and Mm. what she is whether you want to take the occult and magical elements of the film at face value or not you do really get a sense of Joan transforming absolutely she is obviously coming from her cocoon and she's becoming a butterfly almost But linking into the fact that I see her being tethered through the ceremony at the end when she's back with her friends and she's having a good time. They're talking about what happened to her husband and she says to her friend how she's a witch. She then suddenly her face just drops and she's you hear in the background that they're saying, oh, that's Jack's wife. So it part of me feels that she is trying to make this change and she is finding herself, but maybe in the time that she was in and the age she was, she's still not going to be able to necessarily be completely free from the shackles of what society puts on you with expectations as a woman. And I think that it was a clever nod saying you may be able to push forward, but, you know, with one step forward, there's always a couple back. And And we see that in a way because we start at, well... We start in a way at a oppressive, boring, stiff cocktail party and we end at an oppressive, mm-hmm. stiff, boring cocktail party. Almost gone full circle. Yeah, except this time Joan is, is very different. Mm. She's a lot more confident, a lot more Even though she hasn't got her husband anymore as well. So she, she doesn't. can just Although I love that the last shot of the film ends on her face mm-hmm. and you just hear someone in the background kind of talking about her mm-hmm. and be like oh yeah have you heard of her jack's wife mm. and then you sort of pause on her eyes and the film ends and obviously jack's wife is um an interesting way to refer to her both kind of not by her name or, or her witch name even but just kind of as a property of a uh, of her husband And also that was one of the versions of the title of the film too. Mm. I think it's showing the two identities that she has and that she's been fighting between because she has declared herself in that moment that she's a witch and then she's also called Jack's wife. And I think it's showing often the duality of living these kind of lives with women that they have to be so many different things all at once. You know, we have to be um, a lover, a carer, a mother, a wife, all of these elements and it's you know you're torn between them a lot of the time and I think that's what they're trying to show that ultimately she's still going to be known as both she's still going to be battling to find her true identity and her true self that's a wonderful note to end on thank you so much for your time and for your insight it was it was a definitely a very good and interesting film to watch on an evening so I highly recommend it good and where can people find more of your work online so you can find me on instagram rowena.alice where i post all about my work and shows that i've got coming up um and twitter i'm at rowena with five a's chalice durable knives they're all witches tools you know well i'm just interested in it And that's it for another episode of the Final Girls podcast. Please do rate and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're everywhere. You can find out more about what we do on thefinalgirls.co.uk and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at thefinalgirls.uk. You can also follow Rowena at Rowena, that's with five A's, and I'm on Anna B. Demented. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned for more witchy goodness next week.